Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to all of you joining us in person here and to the large audience online for this event on resetting Africa-Europe relations from self-deception to economic transformation. I'm Sara Pantuliano, I'm the chief executive at ODI. So we'll focus on this event on uh, discussing some of the issues that Professor Carlos Lopez, which, whom I will proceed to introduce very shortly, discussed in uh, a recently um, published book, The Self-Deception Trap, exploring the economic dimensions of charity dependency within Africa-Europe relations. So we, what we want to do is really discuss some of what uh, um, Professor Lopez um, emphasizes in the book, looking at how we can foster a more balanced and advantageous partnership between the two continents. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping rules, um, just to remind all of you that even though we are at Chatham House, the event is on the record. Um, it's been live streamed on the Africa Programme Facebook and Twitter. Um, and so it will be for you if you want to refer to things that have been said um, on the record, feel free to attribute them. Um, I'd like to remind all of you to put your mobiles on, uh, on silent, uh, but also um, remind you that you cannot film parts of this event um, uh, without prior permission from Charter House, but you can tweet about it. If you're still using X, um, I am not, but for those who are, you can use the hashtag CHAfrica. For those of you who are joining on Zoom, um, please mute yourself uh, during the presentations. You will though be um, able to use the Q&A box uh, uh, function and you can submit questions through that function. Um, if you want to um, ask questions live, please let the team know um, online, otherwise I will read them through the chat. But without further ado, let me introduce the guest speakers for today. Really delighted to be in this conversation with Professor Carlos Lopez. Um, Carlos is a professor at the Mandela School of Public Governance at the University of Cape Town. He's a visiting professor at Science Po. He's an associate fellow in the Africa program at Chatham House, and he's a visiting senior fellow at ODI as well. <laughs> um, and he's had such an illustrious career and so many leadership positions. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention two or three because otherwise we'll, we'll be here um, talking about Carlos' very long and distinguished career. But he has been the policy director of the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, executive secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Africa, and uh, um, the AU High Representative for Partnership with Europe. Um, next to Carlo is Professor Eka Ikpe. Eka is the Director and Professor in Development Economics in Africa at the Africa Leadership Centre at King's College London. And her research is really focused on a critical understanding of socio-economic transformation processes and really centering you know, spaces in Africa as across the fields of economic development and peace. Um, Eka's research has supported the work of uh, the UN Economic Commission for Africa, the Economic Community of West African States, the UK All Party Parliamentary Group on Africa, many global NGOs, and ECA is also a member of the Board of Trustees of ODI. So I feel like I'm with family here. Um, and I am with family because these conversations really matter. They matter for Chatham House, as they matter for ODI, and they should matter for all of us that are interested in the relations between Africa and Europe. Because the conversations around you know, these relations are taking place within a wider global context of increased fragmentation, of increased volatility. Uh, you know, the global economy is being rewired in an acutely competitive fashion. You know, we're seeing a real power scramble on top of the green and digital transition. And I think that's really undermining the potential for a collaborative structural change. We're seeing industrialized nations that like the fiscal firepower, especially in Europe, and they really risk being left behind in this you know, race to um, subsidize newly critical industries. And then powers, um, such as those in Africa, they can ascend by controlling the resources that underpin these industries, and I think can carve um, economic niche in the new value chains, which I know Carlos has been discussing and writing for about for a long time, so I'm really looking forward to hearing more on this. It is three years since the AU um, EU summit in Brussels of 2022, and I think there is you know, more and more skepticism about the progress on key commitments, including the, you know, the famous or infamous EU's global gateway infrastructure 
plan and the climate finance uh, promises. You know, we see European policies such as the carbon border adjustment mechanism, the famous CBAM, the deforestation regulation, the ship recycling regulation, they all have extraterritorial extra -territorial impact and, and so they point to a significant divergence in policy agendas. At the same time, Africa is really aiming to enhance its global influence, um, including through the AU first time participation in the G20 summit in November. So all of these issues are really important to consider for you know, those of us who really want to try and build a fairer economic relationship that can benefit both Africa and Europe. With that in mind, Carlos, I'm really looking forward to hearing your reflections on uh, these issues. And then I'll give the floor to Eka for um, her response and then I'll open up to the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. It's really a pleasure to be with you in the same podium. Thank you, Eka, also for making it. Um, it, it's going to be a conversation amongst uh, people that uh, admire each other in terms of the contributions in this field and particularly this subject, which is a, a subject that touches us emotionally. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book. This book uh, tries to demonstrate that the relationship between Africa and Europe is much more deep rooted uh, in uh, a certain number of characteristics that normally are discounted, like for instance, the emotional ones that derive directly from history and from perceptions, from narratives. And, and that's why getting it right is so important for Africa because the, the size of our partnership with Europe in trade terms is uh, quite significant, is the most important trading partner of the continent, is the number one provider of ODA is also the number one in investment stock. Now, what is interesting is that when you refer to these numbers, obviously you have to qualify them by mentioning the fact that they are very much enshrined in a past rather than a future glaze on the relationship. Because investment stock, for instance, is very important, but new investments, not so much. ODA was critical in percentage terms, no longer. Uh, trade with Europe continues to be number one, but when you look into just one country like China, is a, a very much approaching that amount and is going to surpass it. And if you look into uh, the number two uh, trading partner in terms of countries, is actually a, a country like India that is already uh, half the size of the trade um, uh, the, the trade size of uh, China. So for those reasons, it was important after I experienced as the African Union High Representative for Partnerships with Europe, so many difficulties to actually try to distill why is it so difficult? Why I failed? That was really a motivation, number one. You know, why, you know, after all the good efforts in terms of a number of actors within the African Union spectrum trying to reestablish a, a, a relationship that would be much more based on the principles that were adopted in our agenda 2063, that I was one of the drafters. Why is it so difficult to make possible for the Europeans to listen? And then I came to the conclusion number one that the reason it was so difficult for the Europeans to listen was because the African leaders were not listening either. So that, uh, you know, drove me to then try to identify what was so ingrained in these uh, difficulties. And I came with this um, metaphor of the self-deception trap. Because in medicine, you, know, you have a lot of people that actually study self-deception and they try to understand why people keep talking certain things, although they don't believe in them, just because it's a way of navigating their own sort of uh, perception of what the power dynamics should produce. And they do this at the family level, at the community level, and I'm just trying to transport that idea uh, and going a bit further and saying, well, if you don't have the right diagnosis, you can't have the right medicine. So you need to diagnose right what is really impeding uh, this relationship from uh, becoming much more fruitful, both sides. 
and I, I believe that the self-deception in the part of the Europeans is that they believe the altruistic attitude they have towards Africa is going to produce development. Well, we should know better, you know, after so many decades of trying and not having that much of a success, we should be contemplative at least of the fact that it is much more difficult than we predicted. So I try to, you know, use a bit of metaphorical language in the book, like for instance, you know, the good Samaritans lost their way. Uh, they have good intentions and the world is full of good intentions, but good intentions are not enough. And then you go into the self-deception of the African leaders, which is basically their need, very strong need to be recognized externally rather than internally for the purposes of maintaining their power. And therefore, you know, being part of anything that they are called for externally is an opportunity for African leader to be seen, to be perceived as important, influential, and therefore they trade that against, you know, whatever gains should come from real negotiation. And this sort of uh, um, perception that I, that I got needed to be a bit more grounded. So I needed to have data, I needed to have facts, I need to describe how it works. So the book tries to go from the aspects of diplomacy, how diplomacy works in a situation like this, and then how the divide and rule is applied in, in very specific terms. In one of the divide and rule uh, opportunities that uh, uh, arise most of the times comes from the way you use ODA, the way you use aid and then how you use it to push certain agendas, although you know, it's camouflage with altruistic and you know, just wanting to have a certain uh, objective that was commonly discussed. So the language is full of uh, slogans like partnership of equals, things like that. But it's completely bogus. It has nothing to do with the reality because the reality is really a very tough one. So I describe what happened to, in this case, an African Union high representative, to the point of being boycotted by the European leaders on any meetings they organized themselves. Only the ones organized by the Africans was I present, or when I was imposed by uh, the African Union. So this is quite sad, because it was not the result of any specific personalization, I realize, but rather because I was putting in place a strategy for Europe that was going to mirror the, the very important and publicly proclaimed uh, European Union strategy for Africa. So, and, and everything was done to impede that strategy of the Africans for Europe to see the day. And uh, you, know, you, you need to read the book to understand what games are played to not make that possible. It's quite fascinating and one of the uh, key uh, trump cards that are used all the time is Af North Africa against Sub-Saharan Africa. That, so it, it, it is important for you to understand the logic of this uh, division that is uh, completely artificial and colonial because as I demonstrate in the book, you know, some of the countries in North Africa are not uh, uh, Saharan, they are even Sub-Saharan in most of their territory and vice versa. So there are some, some sub-Saharan countries that are Saharan countries, like you know, Niger or uh, um, a country like Mali. So anyway, uh, it is important for us to understand these dynamics. But then this was not enough. It was important to see the structural reasons behind these attitudes. And the structural reasons have to go all the way to certain very important tenets of the way we look into these countries. One of them, the most important in the book that I explore is the theory of comparative advantages. A Ricardo theory and you know, how it was applied and how it boxed Africa into commodity producer and exporter without value addition and how along the way, you know, everybody has accepted because it's sort of a theory that was full of recognition, but then the way it was implemented and applied distorted completely the possibilities of structural transformation in the country. So I tried to demonstrate that. 
and I'm very pleased that amongst the reviewers of the book, you have people like uh, Danny Roderick, uh, Ajun Chang, uh, Jayati Ghosh, that are uh, trade, uh, known as trade experts, and, and, and they endorse, they endorse my uh, assessment and even say that it's, it's viscerally revolting, you know, when, when they, they read, you know, sort of the factual demonstration that I try to provide. Another one is uh, the Malthus theory about uh, demography and the Malthusian interpretations of demography and how they are contaminating the way we look into the demographic shifts in Africa and of course all the debate on migration. I have here a colleague from the Nelson Mandela School, uh, Alan, Professor Alan Hirsch, that is actually studying the migration issues in more depth. But you know, it's basically that, that sort of debate that is quite important for us to, uh, to, to try to understand structurally. So, and, and I go all the way to the CBAM and what I call the, the battle of jurisdictions, which is this extraterritoriality imposed by the powerful and, and how you preserve uh, the characteristics of a symmetry in the relations between the, the, the most powerful and the most vulnerable, in this case, if you want, Europeans and Africans, by using new methods that now very commonly take the climate discussion and distort it to actually continue the, uh, the asymmetries of the past. So, and, and, and to continue also to box Africans exactly in that principle of, you know, this is your comparative advantage. Now our comparative advantage is to produce carbon credits. So we always have, you know, sort of, a, we always have something that puts us into a box that wouldn't allow us the structural transformation we need. So that's what the book tries to uh, present in detail. We, it is divided in three big blocks. The first block is actually the history, the roots and the evolution of intricate e Europe-Africa relationship. I go all the way to try to understand why the Africans have this sense of, uh, you know, not being recognized, their identity and the issue of inferiority in the treatment of Africa. So I go to uh, the likes of Amilcar Cabral, Franz Fanon, etc. to try to, uh, Peter Ecke, uh, try to demonstrate that this is a debate that the Africans have actually uh, delved into uh, quite some time, but unfortunately, social science is being organized also around the symmetry. You know, a lot of these thinkers and these contributions are not properly recognized, so I try to rebalance that. And then there is a, a second block that is basically about the challenges of the current negotiating processes. And, you know, I go all the way to the summit, um, uh, the last summit, the EU-Africa summit in Brussels 2012. No, sorry, 2022. And I actually uh, had some research assistants counting in detail all the different initiatives for Africa initiated either by the European Union or by one of the leaders of the Union at a given point. So you have these presidencies that are rotating. And uh, uh, also European countries that were either leaders of G7 or the G20 always had an initiative for Africa. So you know how many from 1975 to 2022, 51 initiatives. And since 2022, there are four new ones. So this is like a proliferation uh, of uh, good intentions that are not backed by anything significant. And there is absolutely no way you can actually evaluate, assess what has been promised in the previous initiative. So this is one of the things that we wanted to get approved in the negotiations leading up to Brussels. And it was one of the reasons I, at a given point, I was kicked out of a meeting because I was insisting we should have a governance mechanism to evaluate what was promised before, which was the Juncker plan of the European Union. But that died. So uh, I'm not going to continue giving you too many examples. You get the point. The third part is basically a contempl contemplative gate of what we should aim for. What, what is it that we could do? to have a real, true partnership. And I try to demonstrate that actually is in the interest of the two sides. 
not only in the interest, it's in the interest of the world. Because if the African and the Europeans, in particular on the climate discussion, but also on the demographic discussion, and to a certain point I try to demonstrate as well on the technological discussion, these three big mega shifts, uh, get their act together, they influence the rest of the world for, for good, for the solutions that are in the interest of global public goods. So um, we, without uh, going into too much detail, because this is not a prescriptive policy book, this is a, an, an analysis, this is an, an attempt to try to demonstrate what uh, has happened that is not correct or that is not corresponding to the proclaimed intentions and what is possible in the future to explore uh, rather than being prescriptive. Since I myself in the book in many, many parts try to demonstrate that conditionality has been sort of the rule of the game and Africans always are the ones that have more conditionality than any other. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, you know, the IMF has a conditionality list that is approved by the board. And this conditionality list, you know, it's sort of the good behavior encapsulated in this list. And if you are a very vulnerable country that has no access to capital markets, they have all kinds of issues related to what I described from commodity dependency and so on, you have a, almost every single point in the list to implement. And obviously, uh, you know, if you are already good, quote unquote, you have maybe one or two things to fix. So <laughs> you could expect that the results are not going to be very performant when you have a very long list and no means to implement. And we can basically uh, reproduce this idea many times over, uh, which is the, the idea, for instance, of the sustainable development goals. You have 167 indicators. So if you go to a country like, let's say, uh, um, Cote d'Ivoire or a country like um, Togo, they produce a SDG report. They produce SDG. They have to try to convince everybody that they are doing the right things. So here is our SDG report. So but where is the SDG report of Sweden? Where is the SDG report of the US? Obviously, they don't produce one. But this is supposed to be a universal agenda. But you see, and for them, it would have been much more easier because obviously, of the 167, probably they could have satisfac satisfactory performance in 150. They will be uh, probably at fault in the climate and environmental related ones. But in most uh, of the social and economic, the picture will be much nicer. But yet, you know, it's just to show you that there is always this asymmetry. And this asymmetry is, is, is actually produced in a way that gives the impression that it's fixable. So here is the, the list of things that you need to do. You need better governance and this. You know, it's completely devoid of uh, contextual analysis. It's, it's, it's sort of an easy, fixable template. And for that, we are going to give you some aid that will make that possible. So let's uh, not kid ourselves. Political economy in the countries is always extremely complex. You have to give a bit of policy space, but beyond policy space, more importantly, you need to change a certain number of regulatory dimensions of the debate that uh, you know I try to point in the book are essential. Like for instance, the way you deal with trade, the way you deal with um, uh, international finance and also the way you deal with issues of uh, industrial policy. So let me stop here because I think uh, it will be more interesting to have uh, a bit of a discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. We're already getting questions through the online audience, uh, but I first want to give the floor to Eke. But listening to you, I was reminded, I, I taught at the University at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Dar es Salaam for a few years. 20 years ago, and these were live conversations in Dar es Salaam at the time, you know, particularly around, you know, this feeling that structural transformation, economic trans structural transformation was being denied, you know, to the mm -hmm. continent in terms of the various policy prescriptions that, you know, were 
and th that was the, an age of you know, budget support, but budget support still came with you know, big conditionality, as you say. But I think what you've done with the book is you know, offer the broader analysis of the historical and policy context and then the data and the evidence that is irrefutable in terms of mm. the various things that really constrained the narrative of Africa in a certain way and really you know, sort of arrived at this asymmetry that um, you describe in the way you know, what Africa should be doing is described yeah. as opposed to what the rest of the world is allowed to do and particularly rich countries. Absolutely. Um, and when it comes you know, to issues like governance and democracy, again, we're very quick to analyze what happens on the continent, but not, what is anal not analyzing what happens back home. But, Eka, let's listen to your reflections. <laughs> no, thank you very much for that. Thank you for that very rich uh, reflection on what, you, what is a very important contribution into this space. Um, I think there are two points that Professor Lopez made that I will sort of anchor my comments on uh, now. He mentioned the idea of a right diagnosis and that's something I'll pick up on. And this notion of self-deception on the Africa side, the need to be recognized externally, vis-a-vis -vis the internal. So this hierarchy in terms of who do we value and who's important, I think that's really going to be at the heart of my reflections because to talk about um, equitable rela uh, relationships between Africa and Europe, which is a big part of even what some of us engage in uh, at King's College London, not far from here, we need to be thinking about which Africans we're reflecting on and how Central African peoples themselves are to that uh, debate. So I think again, you know, uh, Sarah also highlighted why this is a good moment to be having this conversation. I'll add another reason to that. We're in a moment where about a week ago we have a UK <coughs> Labour Prime Minister saying this is not a moment to be reflecting on reparations, um, that we cannot keep going over uh, the past. But as he has discovered, <laughs> We can and we must keep confronting that reality. Because of course it's not the past, it's a space we exist in today. Coloniality very much shapes the world we live in today, and especially how differently that world locates peoples in various uh, parts of the globe and in relations to one another. So one of those names, you know, you cited many very important scholars uh, from the African continent. Another one I'll add to that list is uh, Claude Ake who, um, as a development scholar, critical economist, critical politi political economist, has long questioned the very premise of development discourse. And I'm a you know, development economist, critical development economist, I like to say. Um, and his key point was around how development itself extends um, and uh, continues the disarticulation of African economies. So that Africa is a space where Actually, good performance means you produce not for African people, but you produce for those elsewhere. We start off with that being you produce for, in many cases, your former colonizers. But we see a path dependence where, and we hear Professor Lopez refer to that, that extends now to other parts of what Jayati Ghosh has termed the semi-periphery. So those in Asia as well, we, we see a continuation of, uh, of that pattern. To some extent, this is also baked in to a, a system, a structure. ODI is doing a lot of work around um, reform of um, uh, finance institutions. And you know, part of the conversations we have to have there are the ways in which a global financial structure requires that the trade that many do must be denominated in dollars and must be around generating dollars, not your currency, but generating a foreign currency. So that means, of course, your priority has to be those external markets. Right? So this is who is at the heart of what we're dealing with or what we're discussing. Um, as I mentioned before, originally that conversation was mainly about Europe and Africa, but it's now about Africa and parts of Asia again. We see an expansion in that global north emerging, but African spaces remaining in a particular sense. I don't want to be simplistic about, th about that either. We know that there have been periods of very strong performance on the African continent. You can think of the post-independence period for one. You can, of course, reflect on Africa rising and how that period actually altered in some ways the relationship Africa has with parts of the global south is when you begin to see capital coming in. You can think of China especially coming into the continent and leading to a lot of expansion in infrastructure that has been very important and is still important today. I'm a Nigerian and it's only now I've seen functioning trains. You know, I grew up in that uh, country and I haven't, I had never saw functioning trains up until now. So I don't want to dismiss uh, all of that. It's been a far more uh, complicated uh, picture. 
Nevertheless, there is an enduring and challenging impact of this dependence, and that is, as Professor Lopez has noted, and many of us are familiar, it's almost trite to say, it, and you know, uh, uh, Sarah, you referred to, um, you know, discussions in Dar es Salaam 20 years ago. It is unfortunate that we're still having those kinds of discussions today. I think it's very telling that you see that continuity uh, there. So you see African economies sort of remaining very vulnerable to exporting these low value um, uh, goods with very unstable prices. This is why it remains a challenge. And I think a key element of that, of course, is also that the majority of these exports are fuels and minerals um, uh, as well. And especially, and this points back to my point around who is at the center of this. You see the exports of these energy products from spaces that are energy insecure. I can refer to my own country, Nigeria, as one of the largest exporters of petroleum. Globally, where in the past 12 months, petrol prices have increased by over 400%. Inflation is at 33% or something like that, very much linked to that energy insecurity. Yet, top of the agenda is extending that export. And there's very, well, there are some conversations about how to deal with other forms of energy domestically, the use of gas, for instance, but this is often seen as a palliative, not as being at the heart of what these economies should be focused on and engaged with. I think what is most troubling is that when we come to debates about critical minerals, there is a sense in which, very sadly, there seems to be a past dependence where we're moving into those conversations yet again. These are the goods that are supposed to, or these are the minerals that are supposed to help us shift, right? And deal with the huge challenges that confront all of us on the globe uh, around climate change, it's supposed to be part of the climate response. Nevertheless, we see the same extractivist logic play a role here in these conversations again. It's hugely, hugely uh, problematic. I want to end my remarks by returning to this question of disarticulation and how and the conversations we're having and the conversations around the interactions between uh, the African continent and Europe must reflect also on this, and this is the point about the diagnosis, must reflect on what disarticulation means for the African continent. If it is not about helping with articulation, then can we be talking about equitable relationships? Let me reflect on something that we've all experienced very recently, the COVID pandemic. We're all in it together, I remember these statements. Um, where a moment came, everyone facing this pandemic, we desperately need vaccines on the continent. There's an opportunity. Part of the global north, you have this technology. Share it with others, we're in a moment of crisis. And my shock, I mean, it should, I shouldn't have been shocked, but my shock in that moment, a rejection of that, with some nuances, of course, but in, in whole, a rejection of this request to waive intellectual property rights come from our global North partners. We're all in this uh, together. I want to reflect on how that actually has gone on to energize some African actors within this space. New conversations around health manufacturing, conversations around vaccines in my own country, new, excuse me, new vaccine uh, uh, candidates, for example, came up funded by foreign capital funded also by domestic uh, capital. Let me add that from the conversations I had with colleagues, there was a sense in which actually Global South partners were more willing to share technology for the development of some of these vaccines. Uh, we see the work of the continental body, so the Africa CDC, a new African medicines agency based in Rwanda, come up to support this as well. Green manufacturing in terms of vaccines coming out from South Africa is, is another point. So this visceral display actually energized something uh, on the continent. How can these elements be at the heart of any conversations we're trying to have? Finally, a new space I'm engaging with. I think we see the beauty of articulation very clearly when we think of creative economies in Africa today. There we see the use of African knowledge. We see African knowledge production. We see innovation. We see influence on a global scale. But the beginning of that story has been actually African producers very focused on their markets, on their consumers, placing African consumption at the heart of that. And the kind of innovation and authenticity that has been enabled by that has seen this global explosion. So I'm not suggesting a sort of an autarky where the point is Africa should stick to Africa and only have those conversations, not at all, not at all. And Samir Amin made this point that it's about 
How do you have a hierarchy of sorts in these relationships? How do we think of Africans at the center of this and the interactions with Europe, the interactions with other parts of Asia are subjugated to that agenda? But then we need the diagnosis. We need to understand what do we, what is development? What is socioeconomic transformation? For whom uh, as well? What goods are we producing? What are we centering in industrial policy and structural transformation to which I'm very uh, committed? And you know, finally, this has really been, um, this sector has been really vibrant. Yes, it's a very small part if you think of contributions to GDP, but we see it was a sector that was very, um, uh, yeah, continued with sustained growth during the COVID pandemic. You see creative producers engage in very high value added activities as well in the way. I mean, you still see problems with extraction and where that surplus is ending up. That's a story for another day. But I want to point to what is possible, right? It's a very small sector, but a space for us to explore um, in an experimental sense. And then my final note, of course, is this was very much at the heart of the work of uh, African uh, continental ideas. Yeah, the OAU, the African Union, um, the Economic Community for West African States, the work of the UNECA uh, as well, very much around how do we think of markets beyond the smaller domestic markets, but to the continental markets, to regional uh, markets as well. How do we place that at the center? And how do we, and uh, Professor Lopez also speaks to that when you uh, re reflect on the African continental free trade area, which is of course vital to this kind of reflection. And how do we manage the tension between that uh, agenda and our trade relationships with others. I think it's doable. I'm not saying it is impossible for us to address that, but how, again, do we think about those hierarchies? What do we place at the center and what do we peripheralize? Let me end my comments there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eka. And the fashion industry, the creative industries may be small, but it's all part of changing the narrative and changing the perspectives. And I think it's so important to see the primacy of that you know, continental markets and looking at the focus there because it changes the conversation about just being, you know, a supplier um, to Europe at low cost and unstable prices, as you said. Let me open the conversation to the audience here and online. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand, uh, wait for the rolling mic, otherwise I'll start with the online audience. I see some hands here. Let's start with the lady at the back. Please introduce yourself as soon as the mic is up. Uh, thank you very much for your conversation, Professor Carlos Lopez and Professor Eka Igbe. Uh, my name is Dochi Ike and I'm an alumni from King's College London and UCL. And I'm also currently a business consultant uh, specializing diversity, inclusion and well-being. So my question is for the both of you. So you both mentioned um, the importance of structural information. And I would like to know what, will, or in your opinion, what will it take for structural structural uh, transformation to happen in our lifetimes? And is it possible for structural transformation to happen in our lifetimes? Thank you. Thank you. Let me take a few. There is a gentleman here at the front. Yeah, my name is um, okay. Lai uh, Yahaya of the African Leadership Institute. Um, uh, two quick questions. One relates to, because now the development discourse, the development relationship is now framed in this sort of climate space, so just energy transition partnerships and, and things around that. And so my, my question really is, is to what extent that China now being a new entrant into this development discourse and the uh, kind of BRICS Global South um, development agenda starting to develop, how this, how this changes things. The second point really is, um, uh, in your book, you're, you're very optimistic about um, the, the role the Africa Union should play and can play. Um, and it'd be great if you, give, you gave a few more reasons to be optimistic about the future of the African Union. Uh, a gentleman here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alan Hirsch. Um, I was the founding director of the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance at UCT. I'm also linked to SOAS and the um, New South Institute, where I'm doing the research on migration that 
Carlos referred to, mostly focusing um, Professor Ikpe on uh, internal migration of Africans uh, between African countries. Um, but I'm also looking at uh, Africa-Europe relations. I'm looking at that more and more. And I think nowhere is the term self-deception more relevant than in the policies and programs relating to migration. Um, the, 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 the European Trust Fund, um, the way that it was constructed, the, the notion of addressing root causes, um, the notion that um, enormous amounts of European money can be actually used to turn around uh, migrants who are traveling to Europe because there are jobs in Europe. Um, so my question is, um, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez um, recently said in the Spanish Parliament, um, we will not grow without migrants. We, need, we must face the fact that we need to be open to migration, to people who are skilled and people doing various kinds of jobs, and uh, which is a very atypical statement for a European politician. Um, we, you know, even, the, even the Labour Party here talks about focusing on stopping the boats. Um, do you think that there's any possibility that the narrative around migration will begin to shift uh, in Europe? Uh, because I think we're ready in Africa to do that. But um, in Europe, how long will it take for that um, uh, narrative on migration to shift? Thank you very much. One last one over there. I'll come back later if you have time, because I also have a few online that I need to take. Thank you very much. My name is Kayode Adini. I'm the co-president for the African Leadership Program at London School of Economics. Um, I just have a simple question. What would you be doing differently, uh, these two Professor Carlos and Professor Eckhart, if you were as young as we are? What would you be doing differently to make things right? Thank you. Great. Uh, let me take a couple from the online audience as well. Oh, do you want to answer this first and then I'll go to maybe online? Maybe. Yeah, it's probably better, right? No, thank you. Th these are great questions, and I'm going to try to group them so we, don't, we, we, we save a bit of time. Um, let me first uh, just mention to Eka that this, this fixation on meeting external obligations is the reason why you also want more recognition from the outside than the inside. For instance, you know, all the macroeconomic policies to meet external obligations. Whether you know people suffer, don't suffer, and so on, that's sort of secondary. What is important is you should have your macroeconomic indicators in such a way that you are going to meet your external obligations. Uh, if, uh, let's say, a more powerful country faces the same sort of pressures, socially, employment, otherwise, and so on, they will say, pragmatically, we have to do A, B, and C, so it's not, it's not possible, so let's negotiate. But pragmatism is something that is not afforded to the vulnerable. The vulnerable have no right to be pragmatic. They just have to you know, uh, implement the conditionality. And that's, that's what you know, eventually makes things the way they are. Uh, and of course, the critical minerals issue uh, and you know, another wave of dependency uh, and that type of dependency is very much the comparative advantage theory that continues to prevail. A certain interpretation of the comparative advantage theory, a static one, yeah. obviously. Um, and of course, we have all this development discourse that I try to assess in the book in more detail, how it evolved, all the way to lie getting now to where we are on the climate dimension. And of course, I'm, I'm very keen on defending an African agenda for climate change. So I'm the chair of the Africa Climate Foundation. So I, I'm very much committed to that. And uh, unfortunately, the development discourse and the climate discourse may be merging, but the finances are not. You see? So you continue to have a discussion about climate finance and the discussion about development finance. The, the discussion about, uh, oh sorry, the discussion about development is very much centered, not uniquely, but centered on ODA. And the discussion about climate finance now is supposed to be some sort of hybrid that will mobilize through targeted interventions in different reforms, more capital from the private sector. So uh, we are in the business of leveraging. I always, you know, I tease people when I'm in these different meetings. I say, 
are you going to leverage something? Because you know, it's everybody leverages everybody. At the end of the day, it's always the small money that is there that everybody's using, and everybody's using the word leverage. So that's, that's the problem. And all the promises on climate finance are supposed to be add-ons, but in fact, they are replacing the development ODA traditional envelopes, but now with the conditionality shifting towards climate which basically means that there is less money, not more money. There is less money. And that's, that's part of the difficulty that the countries have because they, instead of looking into their domestic capabilities, because you, you know, if you manage properly your fiscal revenue, it's possible to increase it. If you manage properly your institutional funds like pension funds, it's possible to do things. But instead of looking into their capabilities, they kind of look into these possibilities of uh, add-ons. And I'm going to give you the extreme example, which is South Africa. Well, it's a country that has the most significant and the most sophisticated just energy transition partnership in terms of uh, description and uh, detail and uh, structural uh, contribution. And I was very much uh, happy that Africa Climate Foundation was one of the partners to produce that. So in order for that to be implemented, you need $83 billion. ODA is supposed to contribute about 8 billion out of the 83. But these 8 billion have been promised over and over in terms of different types of contributions. It can be some capital markets intervention, can be some investment, can be some equity, but the ODA, ODA proper, is supposed to be just for leveraging. We, here, here you go. And this leveraging is not producing the results, so we keep just discussing. Now, what is fascinating is that this country that has probably the most capable capital market could have solved the problem with its own resources. Why is this not happening? Well, because the regulatory systems that are in place are not favorable for that type of outcome. I, I'm always flabbergasted and shocked that uh, the largest corporation in South Africa in terms of capitalization, which is NASPERS, has transferred out of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange an offshoot to create an arm in the Amsterdam Stock Exchange called Proteus. And with that, just with a stroke of a pen, almost, 120 billion left South Africa. 120 billion, and you're after your 83. I mean, you know, you have sort of these incongruences that demonstrate that we are not really taking seriously the lessons of Asia, which is basically count on your own uh, strengths first, and then, you know, don't, don't, don't fix your head on ODA. You know, I have nothing against ODA, but this is not one that is going to produce the structural transformation. There we go. Structural transformation will require <coughs> a much more convincing set of policies. Uh, we don't have time to elaborate here, but m basically we cannot do structural transformation the same way from one decade to another. Because when you, uh, when you actually, the good image is the one from uh, Akamutsu, this uh, flying geese. So you cannot really imitate the geese that is ahead of you. You have to improve. You have to do something different. And there are lots of things that Africans can do right particularly on green industrialization. But of course, for that, they need to change the comparative advantage interpretation that they have right now. It has to be a dynamic one. And how we can propel certain types of uh, choices, policy-wise. And uh, to, to make sure that this was not just a discourse, I actually put my hands into trying to make this happen. So I'm not going to make a propaganda here, but you know, as part of an effort by African institutions, particularly the African Finance Corporation and the African Export-Import Bank that fund an undertaking called the RISE and that, that undertaking is building industrial parks but based on the concept of an integrated policy. So you go all the way to what kind of uh, national policies you need to make one specific type of commodity in country X to no longer be exported raw. <coughs> And this is, you know, you can take the example of Gabon with, uh, with wood. You, you have the example of Benin 
with the textiles, you have the example of uh, Togo with the soya and so on. And then, you know, from day one, you start working on banning all exports of that raw commodity, period. And in a very short period of time, two, three years. And then, you know, everything is organized for the transformation to take place in the country itself. And it's happening. It's happening. So this is, was a business four years ago started with 100 million. Now it's 1.5 billion business. And it's just growing. So it's possible. It's not, it's not rocket science. But it requires a certain type of political commitment. And it's not with ODA money. You see, this is not with the ODA money. It's a different proposition. It just so happens that in the case of Togo, then the German uh, government decided to fund a training uh, center to you know, uh, train uh, professionals to work in these industries. That's excellent. But you see, it's complementarity, not the centrality of ODA that I have uh, uh, more of a problem with. And obviously, um, this uh, uh, migration discussion, Alan, um, the answer to your question is that, you know, most of the money from the European Union for migration is going to Frontex. It's going to policing the borders. And another part is going to externalize the treatment of migrants outside Europe. That is actually becoming more and more popular and it's going to increase. So what is remaining for the root causes is very small. And it's part of self-deception. Because in fact, if we look into the demographic trends, we have no time to go over that. But if, if there is one chapter in the book where you know, people normally get shocked is with the numbers that are there that I didn't invent about what is likely to happen in the markets. Uh, I'm talking about labor markets in terms of uh, needs that cannot be met without Africa, period. Cannot be met without Africa. And uh, you know, this recognition, when is it going to come? I don't know, but it's going to come one way or another. You know, uh, when Gatwick Airport will not be able to operate for a week, it will come. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just a matter of time uh, because even countries like China and others are aging very fast. So this is now becoming really a reservoir that Africans have the privilege uh, because of their late come, late come status. And last but not least on the AU, well, we, we indulge in blaming the AU for everything. Uh, but it's, it, you know, I, I think it's, it's partly fair, but uh, it's also uh, very, very much exaggerated. I'll just give you three examples very quickly and then we can discuss uh, after, after the session. Uh, one example is the CFTA. If you look into the timeline of implementation of the CFTA, although it has lots of issues and so on. It's the timeline that you know, matches what similar undertakings uh, took elsewhere. So it's not like the Africans are late, it's just that we are anxious. We want things to happen immediately. But you know, it's, the timeline is perfectly uh, uh, acceptable. If you take the example of uh, financing of the organization, you know, people continue to shoot uh, numbers about how much external funding uh, the African Union receives. Those figures mostly are wrong now because the African Union, uh, when we started the African Union reform process, I was one of the members of the team, it was dependent on external funding for 70% of its activities. Now it's the other way around. So it finances 70% of its activities. So it, this is progress, but you know, we, we, are, we are not very good at recognizing that process, uh, progress. The uh, third one is the um, one that I know that uh, Alan is uh, working in more detail, is the uh, Africans' access to other African countries. So w we would like to have it universalized, right? We are not yet there. But the progress year after year is always in the good direction. So year after year, there is more access of Africans to other African countries without visa or with visa on arrival. And I think this is three indications of progress, just to temper a bit our strong criticism of everything.
thank you so much, Carlo Sega. Before I give you the floor, there are a lot of questions online. Maybe I'll just read two or three if you are able to address them in your uh, reply. That would be great. I just want to be fair to um, colleagues online as well. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can't, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't get to all those who have asked questions. Um, but you know, one, one uh, question is from Ambassador Wilson about Nijida Agbot. He says, how can trade agreements be structured to benefit African economies rather than perpetuate dependency? Uh, Sophia Shaloya asks how much the neutral position of more than half of African countries plus the absence of positioning from the EU on global issues such as the war in Ukraine play a negative role between the EU and the AU. And Nelly Ebruka says, I want to understand how we identify the line between encouraging African autonomy in science and technology while acknowledging the current dependency on EU scientific resources. It seems to be a recursive problem. And then maybe this one, um, Chi Joke Osuji. Um, I agree Africa's relation with the EU is very important to the turnaround of the com continent for the benefits of its citizens. This centers on four important issues, democracy and governance, strong institutions, immigration and climate change. This requires compromises on both sides. Are the EU ready for such compromises and sacrifices to help Africa realize her enormous potentials? I think you may know the answer to this one. Uh, but the, uh, there are a lot more questions that perhaps you can get to afterwards uh, because we only have like three minutes. <laughs> Sorry, so I w yes, I'll, I'll just touch on them. I think Professor Lopez already gave very rounded responses to many of the questions that came before. The question on, on young, young, younger people, what, what I might do differently as a, as a younger person. Um, I don't know that I would, I mean, I think I've always been committed to a sort of critical agenda. Um, and I think this is, this has to be at the heart of, well, I, I, you know, I guess also we need to engage, certainly younger people need to be sitting in conversation with others and very central. This points on who, the hierarchy, who is at the center, because actually, the decisions that young people will make in not too long will impact all of us. So I think this idea that the peripheral and the work we do at the center uh, at King's is really around that, that actually it should be very central to these uh, debates and it should be a dialogue, not an invitation to come in, but it should be a dialogue and a co-working, a co-construction of the path forward. Myself personally is that this has to be around critical perspectives. It has to be ar around recognizing the hierarchies and the way the global political economy structure, that is not a thing of the past. And if I have concerns, is the sense in which sometimes that is portrayed as something we've moved on from. Things are different. We all have uh, uh, mobile phones now, so we all have access to the same uh, things. But of course, we go b beneath that and who owns the technology around that? Who owns those companies? And we don't all have the same thing. So one key point I would make, and I think the, the protest we saw in Kenya uh, in Nairobi in June, um, I was heartened to see uh, young Kenyans actually speaking with this critical perspective uh, in mind, recognizing that they had a fight with their own government, but also with a global political economy system that have placed their governments in certain positions and being forced to take um, certain policy stances that were harmful to the wider population. So that complexity, I think, is, is really critical. Um, around, so I'll pick up on the points uh, online now. Um, Trade agreements and, and African economies, I think it's negotiation. I think it's, you know, some of the work that Professor Lopez have been doing, but I think also is the collective. And that's also not easy. It sounds all very kumbaya and yes, we can all sit together and we can agree, but we know our continent itself is very diverse. We know our interests are also very diverse. So that's going to take a tough conversation uh, as well. But I think it has to be collective when you see um, sort of the challenges with the economic partnership agreements, for example, those who managed to hold out, those who said, actually, you won't speak to only my country, you will speak to the group of us. I mean, the kind of arguments Nigeria can make are not, you know, with all due respect, maybe not the same kind of arguments Togo might be able to make, right? But if you pull together, then that picture can look, um, can look very different. But the diagnosis is key. It's not to what end, what are you trading? for what are you trying to achieve? And I think this point on structural transformation is critical. I think, you know, Prof, you've already said it, it takes different, um, it looks very different um, and it, tra it transitions, it changes over time. And I certainly don't want to give the picture that nothing is going on. There's a lot going on and we can pick up on that a little later. 
the, the last point I think is really critical. I mean, all the questions were really, really important, but one I wanted to speak to is African autonomy on science and technology and, you know, of course, the fact that this technology, the science, the capital, we know that hegemonies of finance sit outside the continent. So I think the argument cannot be we're just going to sit and do it ourselves. Some of that we will sit and do ourselves, but some of it we will negotiate to get, but we will subjugate to needs that we have domestically. Again, that's going to take some doing, but others have done this, and some are doing this. I mean, the periods in Ethiopia where that was very much how things were being done under Mele Zenawi, where it's like, this is what we want to achieve. This is what we'll say no to. This is what we'll say yes to. What can we shift a little bit to achieve what we're after? But you have to know what you're after when you go into those spaces. We need that science and tech, but we have our own science and tech as well. How do we deal with those uh, um, together? We can do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I can't give you the floor to add. Uh, we'll, we'll we can carry on afterwards, but I need to close uh, the conversation. Uh, Thank you so much, Carlos and Eka, for such a, a vibrant exchange. I said at the beginning, I think this is a particular moment where we really need to come together to advance a different narrative, um, you know, to push for different approaches, for a different policy discourse. But as you say, we can't be naive. We need to uh, be fully cognizant of the divergence of interest that is out there and embrace that in the fight, if you would. And I think that goes also to you know, the, the development community, um, of which, of course, my institution is a part, because as you say, order is not the answer. Order, you know, can be central to this. It can at best be complementary, but our efforts, if we really believe in, you know, sort of in, in, in the efforts to advance, you know, this uh, transformation have to be centered on fairer trade and investment policies. Uh, migration policies that, you know, recognize our mutual interest. Technology transfer, because that is at the heart of it, is the most important thing if we really want um, the continent to uh, finally harness its full potential. But thank you very much for such a fantastic conversation. Please join me in thanking very much Professor Carlos Lopez and Professor Eka Ipke.